Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank Klaus uh, to for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Kodadad, um, for your generosity and really for your interest in aggression research. Uh, because, you know, one of the problems that we have, people who are committed to the study of aggression and violent behavior, is that really there's no uh, fundamental platform for this type of study. And so what happens is we find ourselves in labs, larger labs, uh, that study, for example, anxiety or substance abuse, and then we study our little piece of the behavior. So it's very important when people find interest in aggression and promote, especially those um, beginning researchers in the area. Um, and both Klaus and I and, and many other researchers in the field um, help promote younger researchers uh, to steer them in the path of aggression research. Um, so I'm from um, Mount Sinai, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'm really an, a research agent at uh, the FBI, Friedman Brain Institute. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, use, I, I start, you know, every time I give a talk, and it's been a lot lately, um, I start with something like this. And there's so much out there. There's just so much. Think about a behavior that kills the person and kills people around them and that we're not really systematically trying to stop. Think about the medical professions. Think about cancer. Uh, think about substance abuse even. Think about other diseases that do harm to yourself and to others and how the Center for Disease Control and the NIH and everybody come together to try to eradicate the problem. This is not happening for violent behavior. It's just not happening. But every time I give this talk, there's a recent mass shooting that precedes my presentation. And there are more days with violence than not. That's why. So it's not random, the fact that every time I give a talk, there's something from, that happened very recently that I can talk about. For example, the latest example was, uh, I think this guy, talk about greed, maybe he's now in the Guinness World Book of Records for the most successful mass shooting. Okay, maybe that's one, that was one of his goals. We don't know. But essentially, there are many mass shootings and there's a lot of violence out there each and every day, each and every minute, all over the world. All over the world, not just in the US. So here you have the expression of the shootings that it's, it's a bit unique to the United States for many different reasons, including just simply the availability of guns. Okay. Uh, but also there are other factors that we may be able to talk about uh, later on if we choose to, depending on your questions. Um, so what I'm studying most of all is um, reactive aggression. And by reactive aggression, I mean that the person has a low anger threshold. We all get angry, okay? But some people get angry as a way of life because this is the way they interpret certain situations. So their cognitive strategies that can propel you to become angry about injustices or about things that you're anxious uh, about, that you fear. And um, even in the context of sports, for example, there are people who are more aggressive than others and they pay a dear price for it. So for example, uh, the famous story with Zidane, uh, who was a very famous um, a soccer player in Europe, and because of this outburst, because the Italian guy, Materazzi, was very smart, he provoked Zidane the right way. Because he came and he whispered in his ear something about his family, something about the women in his family. So it was a very intimate way, okay, to press his anger buttons, right? And, and of course, France loses the final, 
and Jidan pays a dear price for his behavior. And you know, if you, you think about Jidan's life, you go back in time and you see the patterns and you see that this is not the first time, that this is a guy who's just very reactive and put in a certain circumstance, he will do something that will really hurt him in his life, career-wise, socially, um, etc. So intermittent explosive disorder, which is mostly the disorder I'm studying, uh, is about that. It's people, regular people in the general population usually, they're not criminals. Uh, a lot of their aggression is domestic. Um, and uh, what propels them is an intense trait-based anger. So they're angry as a way of interpreting the world. Uh, and why am I studying reactive aggression versus the, most, uh, the more sexy uh, psychopathy? Okay, what is psychopathy? Psychopathy is an aggression that's more instrumental, it's well planned. Um, usually, um, anger and traits of anger are in common between people who are instrumentally aggressive and people who are reactive aggressive. All of these things are important. The typology of aggression is very important, right? Because there's so many ways that people can become aggressive. And I study reactive aggression because it has higher prevalence in the general population. About six to eight percent have reported patterns of intermittent explosive disorder versus 2% in psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder. And these 6 to 8%, it's a similar rate for women as well. So, and, and these are studies that were done by Kessler, uh, who did epidemiological survey studies over, over uh, a, a very uh, um, extensive population of people. And so the rate of 6 to 8% is a pretty high rate, very similar to the rates of drug addiction in some um, addictive substances. There's higher heritability, so twin and family studies suggest that this type of aggression, particularly the irritable and the impulsive one, as differentiated from the, uh, the premeditated one, has substantial heritability. Again, talking about externalizing psychopathology and um, conduct disorder, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's all part of the trajectory of reactive aggression and intermittent explosive disorder. And I'll try to, to flesh that out a little bit as I go along. So the way that we do studies in our lab, it's very important to describe that to you. I do human studies. It's with men from the general population um, and the way that we do these studies is that these individuals come to us and we subject them and we subject our study um, to this type of strategy. We start with um, um, long neuropsychological testing uh, that targets different cognitive functions such as attention, executive function, reward, salience attribution, the importance that you attribute to things that are important to you, that are salient, Inhibito inhibitory control, all of these different tests. Um, and then the, the, the people also get genetic testing and blood, uh, blood withdrawals and a set of imaging. And we have hypothesis testing that we can test already at this level with many, many individuals at the level where you don't have to do imaging and it's, it, it's not as expensive. And then we do correlation studies, and, and then we very carefully select our phenotype. It's very important to select your phenotype correctly if you do multi-level um, extensive imaging studies. Okay, because everything depends on these individuals, on these well-characterized samples. And so we put a lot of energy to characterize our sample. Um, this is just because I know I'm talking to mostly to um, Dr. Mitchell's lab, but also a lot of people who do basic studies, and I always implore that um, it's very important um, for people who do animal study to do a little bit of back translation and really pay attention to the uh, more 
uh, infralimbic, prelimbic, and medial prefrontal cortex areas, because the medial prefrontal cortex has um, some volume in, uh, in mice, and it's very, very important to, to try to study it, even though it's perhaps more heterogeneous than the particular regions the subthalamic regions that, um, uh, that are studied in aggression in uh, animal studies. Okay, so these are the studies that I'm going to describe to you. I'm going to talk about monoamine oxidase A, gene-brain behavior relationships uh, to treat anger and to addiction. I'll be talking about brain response to violent media because we did a, a research study on that, and I think that uh, it's very, the results were really very interesting. Um, and also a study that we recently did on intermittent explosive disorder. So all of these studies in the beginning are studies on men from the general population, young men from the general population who vary to the extent of, of their aggression and other personality characteristics. So I'll start with monoamine oxidase A. Uh, do you guys know the story of MAOA? Can you raise, raise your hands? Because it really depends uh, how fast I'm going to go through it or how slow. Um, do you know the story of that one Dutch family where there was a deletion? OK, it's a very nice story. In the 90s, <laughs> in the 90s in the Netherlands, uh, this uh, psychiatrist, or I don't, I don't remember who, a what? A geneticist, okay, um, found that there's a mutation in the MAOA gene of a single family where the males were especially violent and aggressive. Uh, they're telling, the, the stories uh, come out that they were so aggressive that the people who were taking care of them had to walk around with a, a cane uh, because once in a while they had to protect themselves. Um, uh, so this was a very violent family, and, uh, and this study that he then published in Science at the time uh, spurred also many follow-up studies that really validated the role of monoamine oxidase A um, in terms of aggression. And what is it? It's an enzyme that metabolizes, it breaks down monoamines, catecholamines and indolamines. Okay? It's a housekeeping enzyme. Every cell in our body has this enzyme. And its activity can be imaged in the brain. So there was a single family with the, the mutation. Later on, of course, mice were manufacturers with a similar de de uh, deletion. And they were very, very aggressive. Um, inhibition of MAOA during pregnancy in rodents and in uh, humans. Uh, result in very aggressive uh, offspring, and it's true in females also, also. Epidemiological studies that show that females who smoke during pregnancy have a much higher chance of having males uh, in their male offspring having antisocial behavior and as well as conduct disorder and uh, attention deficit disorder. And that's after you control for many, many variables, including the genetic inher inheritance variables. Um, so that's inhibition of MAOI. And also smoking, smoking cigarettes, is an MAO inhibitor. So whenever people smoke cigarettes and um, they're really inhibiting their MAOs, it's a very similar effect, like, like an antidepressant. And that's one of the reasons that um, many individuals have a hard time quitting smoking because it does this action on um, MAO A and B. And so after the mutation was found and it was tested on mice, okay, that's okay, we've established that there's a relationship. But what about people in the general population and the genetics of MAO A? And at the time, I was at Brookhaven National Lab, and I started studying this. And there were many, and I was very lucky because uh, this study came out, followed by this study. So what this study shows, okay, this is a population study that was done in the UK by researchers in the UK uh, from a New Zealand sample. So it's a whole population of boys. And these boys were followed up 
from the pregnancy of their mothers until the age of 28, 29, I think now they're in their 30s, okay? And there have been follow-up with uh, interviews and questionnaires and links to psychiatric disorders and links to, to the justice system, everything. And what, these what, what they found, Caspi et al., was the children, of all the children who were exposed to childhood maltreatment, to abuse when they were children, uh, of course, most of them were not exposed to abuse, and some of them were exposed to probable abuse. You know, it's a little bit there, but can't be confirmed exactly. And some of them were exposed to severe confirmed abuse at childhood. Okay? Later on, um, they followed up with these individuals, and those who had the low MAOA genotype, okay, who were exposed to severe abuse had, had around nine-fold higher chances of having antisocial behavior and high aggression as adults. So only if they had the low MAOA genotype and exposed to severe abuse, the disease was expressed. If they had the low MAOA genotype and were not exposed to severe abuse, severe, not even probable, they, they, did, they did not, then MEOA had nothing to do with aggression. It had to do with aggression only with the stress of childhood maltreatment. Okay, so this was done on the population level with an MEOA genotype. The genotype means that there's a variability in the population, just normal variability. Some men have the low genotype, some have the high genotype. And so when you look at these individuals in terms of MRI, fMRI, and also structural MRI, and you take a, lo a, a large cohort of individuals, males, who have either the low or the high MAOA genotype, who are not aggressive. Remember, they're not aggressive. They're just males from the general population. They either, either have the low or the high genotype, OK? But those who have the low genotype or not aggressive have less gray matter in the anterior cingulate, and also many other sort of brain factors that show impulsivity that are in common to externalizing psychopathology. So we could call it susceptibility. We could call it genetic susceptibility. And again, when I was at Brookhaven Lab, I was able to image monoamine oxidase A in vivo in the brain. So I was able to, I was at a position that I was able to link the activity of the enzyme to aggressive behavior in, in males with the phenotype. And that was a very special thing that we were able to do at the time. Because at Brookhaven was a place where they developed ligands to study important proteins in the brain. And that's something that, that we cannot do with MRI. We can do that only with positron emission tomography. And I was lucky enough that at the same time, Joanna Fowler was developing um, brain MAOA with uh, carbon-11 chlorgeline. Chlorgeline is an MAO inhibitor. And I will show you a little bit more about uh, how positron emission tomography works and how we can image MAOA in the brain. So we did that. And what we did is we started with just the general population of males, people from the general population, 38 males. Uh, we, did, we imaged their brain MAOA in vivo with C11-chlorgeline. We also did a resting state brain function with PET-FDG at the same time. And we also used MRI for brain structure all on the same individuals. We also assessed them for the low or high MAOA genotype. Okay? Uh, we took measurements of verbal and nonverbal intelligence, back depression inventory, and the multidimensional personality questionnaire. So essentially, and that was not my work, that's the work of Joanna Fowler, who's a very, very um, talented a chemist and a very dear person. She's one of the people who developed the FDG. And she never chose to patent it because she was not greedy. 
she wanted everybody to use it. Everybody. And now FDG is used all over the world to detect tumors all over the body. And it's free. Nobody pays for using FDG. Thanks to Joanna Fowler. So FDG can be used as a marker of brain function. And that's why, I, that's why we use it, not to detect tumors, but, also, but to detect brain function. And it was used um, for a long time before functional MRI started to be, um, to be used. And so uh, a ligand is injected uh, into the person. It travels to the brain. And then you have an image uh, through the PET scanner of the distribution and the activity of that specific enzyme or protein that you're looking for uh, in, the, in the brain of the individual. And so the first question that we asked was, okay, so people with the low MAOA genotype would also have low activity of MAOA in their brain. That was our first question. We predicted that, yes, there would be a correspondence between your gene and the activity in the brain. Low here, which should be low there. But we found that no, there is no correspondence. So people with the low or the high MAOA genotype did not have corresponding low or high MAOA in their brains. But instead what we found, that the MAOA en enzymatic activity in people who were aggressive was low next to people who were not aggressive. And there was a negative correlation between aggression and activity of this enzyme in the prefrontal cortex, but also in other brain regions. And so you can see um, the distribution of aggression here. You can see that there are people with zero aggression, and then it ranges all the way to 14. And this is the distribution of MAOA, the activity actually of MAOA in the brain. And you can see that the negative um, uh, relationship has nothing to do with the genotype. So people of different genotypes are spread all over here. And so when we took a look at individuals who are aggressive in this left panel and individuals who are non-aggressive, um, and this is a heat map of the brain of axial slices, and so red means more activity and blue means less activity, right? And yellow is sort of in the middle. You can see here on the level of the thalamus the differences between the groups. These are non-aggressive individuals and you can see here the activity of MAOA in thalamus, which usually has the highest uptake. And on this level, the non-aggressive individuals who have much less of the activity. And I also want to bring your attention to activity here in the cingulate cortex, because many of our results um, point to the medial prefrontal cortex, to the anterior cingulate, to the dorsal cingulate, and you're going to see that uh, pretty soon. So the next thing that we wanted to know, okay, so what is the enzyme, what does it have to do with brain function, with brain structure? Does it mean that the fact that they have less less MAOA, the aggressive individuals, does it mean that they, they would have also less gray matter or sort of less neurons in these regions and less metabolism, less glucose metabolism, less activity in these same regions? In other words, does the MAOA enzyme have a, sig a functional significance? And so what we did is um, we put a seed a seed correlation with structural images from the same individuals. And what we found was that this part, which now I called sort of part of the default mode network, okay, but at the time um, we didn't identify it so much as part of the default mode network, but just say if, uh, as a medial prefrontal cortex or the anterior cingulate. And when you do the same with FDG, which is a marker of brain function, then you can see the same region and how it extends uh, to the brain stem, including the areas where cat catecholamines and uh, endolamines are uh, produced and distributed. So why is it important? Why? 
because a friend of mine, his name is Kent Keel, has an MRI in a truck in New Mexico, and he drives to prisons, and he images people in prisons, people who are extremely violent to the point that the police picks them up and they, they, they stay in that cycle of the prisons. Recidivism is very, very high in the prisons, okay? And what did he find? That, uh, wait, where is that region? That gray matter in this region, in the prisoners, will predict if they will be rearrested and how long it will take them, how many months it will take them to be rearrested. And he found that people who have high response in the cingulate take longer to be rearrested than people who have low response in the cingulate. And so here's an example where one brain region can predict, to a certain extent, future behavior, future violent behavior. And so that's where translation uh, sort of goes all the way to the phenotype that is, you know, the one that we all know, the, the criminals in the jails, etc. So you have Klaus who studies mice, and then I study humans, you know, but basic studies because I don't study criminal humans, but humans in the general population. And then you have Ken Kiel who's studying the, the, the most, uh, you know, the, the most difficult pathology. So what do we know thus far? This is sort of a summary uh, of what we know thus far. And we know, for example, that um, the MOA genotype is connected to expression of the phenotype of aggressive behavior only in the, um, only when there's severe stress, okay? And that's very important to know because 40% of males have the low MAOA genotype. Okay. Um, and then we also know that the enzymatic activity it's, itself leads to the phenotype when there's a, an inhibition, either acute or chronic, of MAOA. So this brain region keeps coming back and the network's associated with it. That's why I'm showing it here again. Any questions at this point? Because if not, then I'm going to move to this. But if yes, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. I think there's a way I think there's a way to test for that. There's also a way to test for whether you know you get abused because you're a difficult child. I mean, more difficult child, the people get more abused because they just, you know, I remember that from being a parent. You know, sometimes you want to flick them, right? <laughs> but but there's a way, in genetic studies, there, there's a way to test for that and to control for that, and they did that. This is a study that uh, was published in Science. Um, go, go to it, it's very, very interesting. They, they had uh, many follow-up studies as well. Um, and they look into conduct disorder and how it develops. Um, so this is not the case, and actually the way that they pitched the story is that people with the high MAOA genotype were protective against developing antisocial behavior, which is very interesting. So even though you were exposed to severe abuse, you did not develop antisocial behavior. So the resilience is a, a different, you know, very interesting story in itself. <coughs> yeah. First of all, I have to say that very few people with mental illness are violent and aggressive. 
Okay, so this, there's a lot of stigma about that, but, and it's not true. It's rare in, in people with schizophrenia, for example, or bipolar disorder, bipolar morbid. But in terms of comorbidity, what we find with people with intermittent explosive disorder is anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression. A lot of it. And, and for example, SSRIs work really well also to reduce anger in people with IED. Okay? Okay, so one of the things that we were very interested in um, was how, okay, so if you have these aggressive individuals and non-aggressive individuals, and there's this, in the literature, of course, there's this debate about people's response to violent media. Okay, we see all of these movies. We see a lot of shootings in the movies. You know, maybe it's because we see all these shootings. That's why we have shootings every day in the United States. And, you know, it's not that simple, but some people say that. Some people say, you know, listen, if you're going to play with violent video games and you're going to watch violence all the time, you're going to become violent. And so we decided to, to see how the brain and the nervous system responds to violent movies if you were to begin with, if you have this, the trait, the aggressive trait, or if you don't. <clears throat> and so uh, we recruited healthy men from the general population again. But this time, and, and we did, you know, we did, this is a huge experiment, so I have to, to slow down and to explain it to you. But we exposed them to three scans at three different times. So one time they came and they got to see um, a nice a video. At this time, at that time, it was videos. And so we took different vignettes from different really good movies that were exciting. There was action, but no violence. So, for example, sports competitions and very moving types of things, people helping each other. Um, it's kind of an exciting movie, and that was our control movie. And we also developed a violent uh, movie, and it's about 30 minutes, and the control video is also about 30 minutes. And the violent movie was really violent. I mean, we used the best directors, you know, um, and we took scenes from Clockwork Orange and from different, it was very, it was it, pretty tough. I mean, we, we tested on people, and people were very uh, moved by it in terms of its aggression. And also, at one time, they came and they didn't see anything. They just lied down like that and not see anything. And we imaged their brain while they were watching the control video, the violent video, or just lying down there. So, and we used PET FDG. This time, what we did is we took out the middle. In other words, um, we surveyed people on aggression, right, from the general population. And, and we had um, sort of this, this type of distribution in terms of physical aggression, okay? And we took out the middle. So we took people who were non-aggressive at all. They didn't report any aggression. And people who reported a lot of aggression on the trait level. And these are the three scans, counterbalanced. They were scanned three times, of course. I'm not going to go into that because um, I want to be able to show you the results and then to show you another experiment, if you'll bear with me. Um, so I'm going to show you this, for example. When they're watching their movie, this is before the movie, this 10 minutes into the movie, and this is the end of the video, okay? So as they were watching, the, the non-aggressive individuals were more upset, okay? than the aggressive individuals. Interestingly, they also showed a progressive decline in blood pressure as they were watching the movie. So as they were watching the movie, we were imaging their brain. Every five minutes, we took their blood pressures, systolic blood pressure. And their systolic blood pressure was, you know, this is very subtle effect. So it was going down about 3%. But still, it was going down as they were watching the violent video versus 
the exciting control video. And the, the non-aggressive individuals, the ones in the blue here, in time, their blood pressure went up a little bit in line with their report of being upset. And what we found in a very, I would call this region gyrus rectus, it's part of the orbitofrontal cortex, it's very ventral, and um, it's close to the olfactory bulbs, and I see this region comes up a lot uh, in relationship to aggression. And, um, and so you can see the differential responses of uh, the, the two groups, the aggressive group and the non-aggressive group, in their front orbitofrontal cortex as their blood pressure was changing. We don't know what it means yet, but still what we do know is that the response to violent media really depends on the brain of the beholder. So it depends on your own traits. In other words, if you're a peaceful person, you're not an aggressive person, you can watch aggressive movies and, and shootings and stuff like that uh, your whole life and it will not make you more aggressive unless you're aggressive to begin with. Any questions about that? Okay, how am I doing with time? I'm good? Okay, good. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a functional MRI study in individuals with intermittent explosive disorder. That's when I moved to Mount Sinai and um, I worked with uh, some postdocs. Um, this is the work uh, by Gabriella Gunn who came uh, from Germany, now she's back in, in Mannheim. And what she did is she gave people with intermittent explosive disorder a task to do. While they're doing this task or this game, they're lying down in the MRI and we image their brain. And so the task is very simple. We tell them, you're gonna uh, play against another person in another lab online and what you're going to both do is essentially you're going to press the A button on the machine. You press, 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 press the A button, you press it enough, you get money. The money shows here. At the end of the experiment, you get the money. Now, you also have another option to press the B button, okay? And if you press the B button, you press, 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 not as much as the A, but still you need to press. You take money away from the other person. It doesn't add up to you, but it takes from the other person. So the guy was like, okay, that's easy. Anyone, any one of us, it doesn't matter, the most violent individual, okay, will press for money, okay? Nobody will just, yeah, okay? The problem is that there are provocations. So the participant is earning money. The money is earned is a specific amount and it adds up, okay? However, the money also goes down when the other person is taking money away from you. The other person is pressing the B button. And that's called a provocation. Okay, so you're making money and somebody here is, you know, just taking it away from you. And you know that they don't even put it in their pocket. You know it because we told you in the beginning. It's very annoying, by the way. And so, no, because we are, are grad students and experimenters and postdocs, you know, they tell me uh, how these people curse and yell and bang and while they're playing the game. But in the MRI, it's slightly different. It's slightly different because you're inside the magnet, it's, it's, the conditions are slightly different. So you press the A button to make money, you press the B button to take money away. Each block lasts about 18 seconds. The resolution of MRI is much better, so we can do that. We can do 18 second blocks and then parse the behavior to see what happens. Um, there's a response rate, so we can see how much you pressed, okay? And uh, there's four six minute runs within these eight uh, second blocks. And so uh, Gabriella modeled uh, the data so that she could compare 
aggression versus money and provocation versus money. Okay? So most of the time people will press that A button. They will ignore the best play the best way to play this game is to ignore the provocation. Yeah, you lose money here and there, but generally if you keep working, you keep earning, at the end of the day you make good money. That's the way to do it. But if you get angry, that's a different story. And what we found, okay, whenever we do any study, whenever I do any study, the first thing is I do is I look at the behavior. Before I look at the brain, I look at the behavior and I let the behavior guide me. Because the way we do studies, usually we do whole brain analysis, right? All of these correlations in the brain, there's always something. I never saw, I never did a, uh, you know, a comparison or a contrast and didn't find any result. There's almost no such thing, okay? So it's very important to be guided by your behavior, by your phenotype. And here's what we found, to our great surprise. What we found that across the runs, okay, here, these are aggressive responses. These are the reactive aggressive individuals. So look at the reds, okay? The, the, the grays here are controls. And in the reds, you see that um, there were aggressive responses, but not, but, you know, not higher than the normal individuals and the control individuals. The individuals with an immune explosive disorder did not buy it. They kept for the money. They were going for the money. Because when we looked at the monetary responses, we could see that. You could see that the aggressive responses go down, taking money away from someone else. And while they were going down across the runs, the monetary responses went up. And so when we look at brain response, we can find what this behavior is driven by. And it's, be, it's driven by salience network, um, striatal regions that really want the money. Really, really want the money. Whereas during retaliation, we see the precuneus and the prefrontal cortex underutilized. And so when you correlate that with behavior, what you can find is that, first of all, the more they will press for money, the more they have this tradal response. Like we see in the salience, the reward um, propelling types of uh, studies with money and uh, with uh, sweet uh, taste and with any other rewards. But also, the more monetary responses, the more the anterior prefrontal cortex response. And so this is what we found, and we weren't sure what, what to make of it, except for the fact that it's possible with an immune explosive disorder to work with reward contingencies rather than punishment contingencies to change behavior. Perhaps their behavior is more amenable to alteration using reward contingencies rather than what is available now, which are punishment contingencies. Are there any questions about this? Before I go to the very last uh, two or three slides, and then... Okay, I'll continue then. The last question, yes? Just a comment. Hmm? The person who developed this methodology that you used... The, the point, point subtraction aggression paradigm. Right, you know, John Sheriff, he had to replace yes. the B button every time because they <laughs> hammered on the B button. Yeah. And when I had at Brookhaven Lab, before I did imaging on this, we had the machine, I got it from him in Texas. And it's this, this big machine, and it has buttons like this. Like each. Now we have it on the computer. But buttons, and you had to exert like force to press on those buttons. And they used to do, they do it with their fists, like this. And, and for the money, they pressed like this. It was interesting. I actually took pictures of it. I used to talk about it in talks. 
and show the picture of the fist versus the, the hand. Okay, so we have more or less a picture of uh, their brain response at, um, when they're doing a task. But I think that what's most interesting really in aggression is not the response to task, but rather uh, the intrinsic environment milieu of their brain when they're not doing a task. And my interest in that peaked um, when I, uh, with the study I showed you of the violent uh, movies, the violent media, because it's sort of a passive um, thing to do, to watch a movie. And so if the movie that you're watching is congruent with your thoughts or your trait, your trait thinking, okay, this congruence may makes you actually relax and not learn something new. Um, and so we did a resting state connectivity study, also because that's what everybody does now, um, to really try to understand, you know, what are the mechanisms at rest when the person is not challenged? What are these mechanisms of the trait, of trait aggression? And so we find that there's increased connectivity between certain regions and decreased connectivity between certain regions. And it's a very um, similar picture that you see with conduct disorder and attention deficit disorder, the same types of, um, of patterns. What you see is um, increase at the network level, the network efficiency level. So that's global connectivity which is uh, the differences between regions that are not proximal, that are far apart. And in terms of clustering coefficients, so regions that are closer together, there's a decrease in functioning. That's overall. And what was interesting to us is the involvement of the habenula and how the habenula might be uh, connected to the other regions that we frequently find um, in um, aggressive individuals and people with intermittent explosive disorder. And so we used the abenula, which was found to be different uh, between the subjects. So abenula connectivity, global connectivity is much higher in people with intermittent explosive disorder. And so if you use uh, this abenula as a seed region, you find that it's hyperconnected to the presental gyrus, whereas uh, there is a correlation between the tabenula seed with the in front, uh, inferior frontal gyrus, where the more aggression, the less connectivity of a benula with in front, inferior frontal gyrus, so the less inhibition uh, by this network. And so this is usually how I wrap up my, uh, uh, my talks because I really like, I, I constructed this slide. <laughs> That's why I like it perhaps. But essentially what I'm trying to convey here, and this, is, this was actually adapted from uh, something that was called the mental wealth of nations. So if we, over the lifespan, from the very beginning, we invest in our children, Okay, they will become good adults and there were very good endpoints here. And so what I did is I adapted this to, to show the progression into aggressive behavior. So this is the severity of aggression and this is your lifespan. And all, all along there, there are factors that provoke people to become aggressive. And so um, these are very important issues to study. For example, the smoking exposure and the inhibition of MAOs uh, during pregnancy. Um, epigene genetic and epigenetic endowment. Uh, there's alteration in monoamines. There's stress exposure that also alters monoamines. There are also times when a disorder erupts. And, and when that happens, uh, there's an escalation because there's a label and people, you know, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy around it. And then it's much easier to graduate. What did I do? 
right? It's much easier from here to graduate to antisocial personality disorder. And so this is the trajectory. And at any point here, it's possible to stop the trajectory. And so I want to introduce um, the people who work with me. It takes a village, especially in neuroimaging. It takes a lot of people, and we all work together in a group-like type of thing. And uh, Rita Goldstein and I are the ones who started the lab. Rita Goldstein was a Brookhaven National Lab uh, before me, and she was the only psychologist in all of Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is a lab that uh, belongs to the Department of Energy, uh, full of uh, physicists. and. Um, and so I met her there, and from there we've been working together, sharing resources, sharing uh, leadership uh, over the lab. Um, and uh, Karen Bucky, um, Gabriela Gan, and some of the other people are, are all our uh, postdocs who work with us. Muhammad Parvaz, our right hand, um, who's an assistant professor. And uh, this, all of the studies I showed you uh, with a PET uh, were done at Brookhaven National Laboratory with this um, entire team. They're amazing. Uh, so this is Rita and I, Nora Volkov, Joanna Fowler. She's the one who developed FDG, who developed MAOA. Uh, and um, the many people continue her work to this day. Um, and Jin Jack Wang and, you know, the whole team. And um, I think that's it. If you have any questions, now is the time. You thought you could avoid the panel, huh? No avoiding the panel. I'd like to point out that I didn't trip. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, good, great. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. So um, I'm very uh, interested in this first component to your talk about the MAOA. And um, I know in the preclinical work and clinical work, we've seen um, lots of evidence showing that actually low levels of serotonin are what might prompt high levels of aggression. So that is a little bit at odds with the MAOA. MAOA. Um, so I'm wondering, the only way that I can kind of marry the two in my head is if the uh, low levels of enzymatic activity are actually a result of some sort of downregulation because there's such low levels of serotonin. And I'm wondering if there's any work that's been kind of going in that direction or, I mean, it could also be that that's why the SRS, SSRIs work because they're increasing serotonin synapse in the synapse and so I'm, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, there is no answer to this question, but one thing I can say is that um, it's important to understand that MAOA and serotonin, they're all very important for survival. Beyond what we're interested in, depression, aggression, uh, increased in serotonin can kill you. Serotonin mm. syndrome can kill you. Uh, when, during pregnancy, okay, uh, the baby's brain is very, very dependent on MAOA from the mother. Uh, and there's usually only MAOA and not B. So it's very dependent on MAO. Uh, for degradation of MAOs, it's very much dependent. So I think there are gating mechanisms. Uh, because MAO is such a housekeeping enzyme, such a, a basic enzyme, I think there are gating mechanisms that will not make it too high or too low. And, um, and that might have something to do with it. I know all of the work of Kakaro, 
and others showing the low serotonin and it's known. And, and also when you smoke cigarettes, it doesn't make you more aggressive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Yep. The it's the opposite, actually. It calms you down. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a lot of uh, problems like that, problems, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure it's problems. I think it's, it's, it has to do with the cross-sectional way in which we study things and, and we do bits and pieces of research, you know. Uh, and so it very much depends, for example, what your baseline is, right, yep. if, if you will be aggressive or not. Um, so there are, there are different factors that go into play and, you know, I don't think there's an answer really out there for that. Is there? Well, there's the story of the warrior gene. <laughs> Monamine oxidase A warrior gene. Yeah, that's how they called it, the warrior yeah, gene. Which, of course, got debunked. So, so yeah, I, because I, they went into the jails and they started genotyping everyone, thinking that they're all going to have this mutation and that's it, it will solve the issue of violence forever and ever. But it doesn't work like that at all. Actually, not even one family since then was found with this mutation, not even one. Um, so wonderful talk, thank you so much for coming yeah. here. Um, so um, I work in Lisa Shin's lab where we focus on PTSD research. So that's really where um, my focus of the question is gonna be. Um, so I'm also interested in the MOA MAOA aspect of your talk. Um, so I just really want to know the interaction between traumatic stress and MAOA. So do you think that individuals with the low MAOA phenotype are more vulnerable to developing um, hyperarousal symptoms of the disorder, or do you think there's an interaction at all with PTSD and the phenotype? Um, in terms of the literature, I'm sure it was tested. Was it? I don't I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Was I mean, it? Does anybody to... know? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, in, th in terms of the literature, I'm sure that somebody tested this. You know, that interaction between MAOA, low or high, mm -hmm. with, uh, the, except for the issue of female versus male. Right. Okay? Yeah. But let's say in males, uh, I'm sure that there were studies like that, but I don't know uh, whether it's linked, if at all. Uh, but the, in PTSD, generally, there's a lot of um, anger. There's also aggressive behavior, of course. There's suicidal and the homicidal behavior. Depends what populations you're looking at, right? You're looking at veterans versus you're looking at more uh, females, uh, sexual abuse types of um, PTSD, different expressions, right, of right. the same disorder. Um, but I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if there was a study. Uh, if anybody knows, I'd, li I'd like to know. Now it will haunt me <laughs> <laughs> until I can go and look to find out. Hi, good talk. Oh, sorry. Very interesting talk. Um, so I was just curious, in both society and in the laboratory, we tend to focus a lot more on male aggression, um, yeah. although there has been um, growing interest in female aggression, certainly um, in preclinical models. Um, so I was just wondering, is there any differences in the way uh, reactive aggression is expressed in females, or is the, and is there any evidence to suggest there might be some differences in the underlying circuitry? Or is that all ongoing research, perhaps? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> it's ongoing, we don't know. However, I, you know, that's my bias. Everybody have their own bias. But my bias is that it is different. That it is different. That, that it is fundamentally a male problem. And it is fundamentally something that men need to change and that we need to help men to change. It's, I don't think uh, that uh, saying, oh, women are violent as well, will help us as a society to deal with what's happening in men's behavior. But scientifically, I think it's uh, very interesting to, to study female aggression. 
And it's very interesting to study female anything, especially in diseases that are more prevalent in females, like many diseases, right? That are still, they're still studied in males while females suffer <laughs> for them the most, right? That's a more important, I think, direction for resources than to study aggression. But that's, I'm talking now philosophically and politically. It's not. But in terms of the science, it's definitely very interesting. Hi, thank you for the great talk. My name is Nav and I work in Dr. Shin's research lab. Um, my research mainly focuses on, or I'm interested in a lot of translational and treatment research. And I know that you just recently spoke in your last slide about how it's possible to stop the trajectory of aggressive behavior from like childhood to aggression to adulthood. So I was just wondering if there's certain approaches that have been taken or there's certain research that you're doing to kind of look into that and exactly what kind of techniques you're really looking into. And then also, have you also looked into translational research into other psychiatric disorders with aggressive behavior? I started studying aggressive behavior in people with schizophrenia. And so psychosis makes makes the person, you know, more vulnerable. And this aggression also comes from vulner vulnerability, of course. Um, uh, I think there's aggression, there could be aggression in any psychiatric disorder. There are psychiatric disorders where uh, a person would be more prone to aggression than other psychiatric disorders. And you can see that by the rates, right? Um, but aggressive behavior is a behavior, okay? It's not a state of mind or, a, or like greed. You know, it's, it's, it's a behavior. I mean, greed can be translated into behavior, but aggression is the behavior. It has its, fa its own face validity. I'm not sure why I said that. Understand what I'm saying? I mean, that's um, now in terms of treatment. I, I'm not in the translation. I'm not there yet. I've been uh, uh, doing more basic research, but I do think that the um, that contingencies, contingency type of therapy, can help can work to mitigate aggression in some individuals. Of course, I'm not talking about psychopathy because. You know, the word out there is that psychopathy cannot be touched. It cannot be ameliorated. It cannot be treated, right? I don't know if that's true. But I'm not sure because I don't know a lot about psychopathy. Yeah? I'm not sure. I think it, it very much depends on the way you ask questions. And intermittent explosive disorder, so, you know, an explosion <laughs> by a man would be more violent than an explosion by a female. On average, in general, in, you know, not a specific person. In terms of the statistics, right? Um, and so there's the severity, right? There's also the typology. So in terms of typology, instrumental aggression is more prevalent in males, much more, something like nine to one. A reactive aggression is, they're saying, is pretty much as prevalent in males than in females. I hope it's, you know, and it also depends on age, for example. Age is a very important factor in aggression. So it depends on what, what specifically we're talking about. But generally, you know, there's always this argument that you know, men and women are not different. 
And if men are violent, women are violent. I mean, it, it's, it, we can find violence in women if we find violence in men. And of all the behaviors, you know, that's, that's pretty true to a lot of behaviors, a lot. But this one, from what I see in the literature, from what I read, is there is something, you know, that's very tightly connected to age and to gender. Although, you know, the shooter was 64 years old. Hey. But 60 is the, f maybe it's the new 20, <laughs> 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's that? Oh. Yes, you go first, he said. So I'm struck from in your summary slide of the positive curve you know, and how much the environment's influencing worse and worse behavior. And then I start thinking about the incarceration of aggressive people. Has there ever been a study of how aggressive somebody is when they go into prison versus how aggressive they come out? They come out more aggressive. Yeah. And they learn, talk about plasticity, right? They learn. Yeah the culture and the behavioral patterns of aggression. You know, even if let's say I would be, I could imagine if someone wanted to hurt my child, that I could be like murderous. You know, it's, it's sort of the only situation that I could, if I want to put myself, because like I'm very like that. But I can't imagine punching someone, because I've never done it. I've never done it. You know, it's, you need to do it, and you need to do it several times to learn, right? And that learning is happening in, in the jail, yeah. yeah. So the question I had had a little bit to do with um, maybe the The problem with us, with whenever we try to learn something, it could be anything, right, is language, right? And typology is part of language. And in a way, we're forced in order to learn, to separate, right? But I think that what is in common of all people who aggress, I mean, all people aggress, so, you know, the people I study and those people who shoot, like the shooter, who is not impulsive, probably, and, not, and he planned and all of that, right? The more instrumental type of aggression. What's in common is the hate and the anger. I mean, I don't know what he's angry about yet, but you can imagine that there's something he's angry about. He didn't just do this as a sport. He also did it as a sport, to do it better than all the other people who did it up until now. Definitely there was that ingredient there. But the anger and the hate is in common. Uh, I, I, I'd like to study anger more and more, but it's very difficult to study. It's easy to make a person afraid, right? I could make most of you afraid if I take a snake out and whatever, or do something. But to get you to be really angry, like genuinely angry, I don't know if that would pass the IRB. <laughs> the IRB would have something to say about that. So it's very difficult to make the behavior come out and in order to study it. And, and one of the things that we try to do all the time is learn from the animal <coughs> studies how to create situations uh, like that. But it's more difficult with humans because they're more 
sophisticated. <laughs> you know, and it's very difficult to create that raw emotion in the lab. So it's dif difficult to study. Uh, I can tell you that people with intermittent explosive disorder also have ad adult ADHD symptoms. When we give them the Connors, the, 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 the adult ADHD scale, um, they, they, ra they rate high, just like people with ADHD. And it's inattention and motor impulsivity. So it's both. It's motor but it's also inattention. And part, I think, a very important ingredient in anger is inattention. Interpretation, but also inattention. Perhaps in people with psychopathy, it's more interpretation. You know, bad, something bad happens and you interpret it as something unfair towards you. Uh, but I think that with reactive aggression, it's more, not the interpretation, but rather the sort of the motor uh, imp the impulsivity, the inattention. So not understanding exactly what, what do you mean by that? Wait, wait, what did you mean by that? Did you mean, like, uh, me, me? So the inattention is a, a, a big. Yes. actually have a brain scan that would help inform a judge as to how you should subsequently be treated, whether you should go to a regular jail or whether you should be going off to other forms of treatment? Do you think this is something in the near future? Damn, I hope not. <laughs> no. No, but wouldn't it be wonderful if you could actually say... I don't think it would be wonderful. Should I think. I don't think no, indi no individual should be in, in a, uh, jail the way jails are today. I agree. Yeah. But, but to select the... I, I gave talks, lectures to judges, state judges and federal judges, as part of the MacArthur or something they called me to give. And I was very happy to do that because it's very difficult. You have to make decisions. When you're a judge, you have files like that. Each file is an individual. You have a couple of minutes you know, to make, to render a judgment, you have to say like that, not like us scientists that we play around. Um, so it's very difficult and my advice to judges is, yes, take that into account as one of your sources of data. It's not the only source. And that's how I take brain scans into account. It's only one source of my data. I pay attention to behavior, I pay attention to other things as well, to genetics, to now we, we look at inflammation and how inflammation influences, uh, you know, that anger is, is a state that increases inflammation like no other, no other emotion increases inflammation like, uh, like, like anger and bouts of anger. People get heart attacks. And it's been written up in the literature. It's been studied. This is just not just caveats or, or some stories, you know. You know the stories of people who get angry, you know, it's not like they get a heart attack. It does happen. And so, yeah, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think ever that we should use brain scans to render a decision, ever. Not even a scientific one. Thank you very much, Dr. Alia Klein. Uh, let's uh, give Dr. Klein a round of applause.